does it take to entertain? For those who live at the edge of extreme entertainment, it usually requires a transformation. Trading oneself for another. Letting go of inhibitions. And taking the audience on a journey they'd never dare take alone. Would you put your life at risk for other people's pleasure? There's a group of performers who do. They're modern day sideshow performers. People who make a living by doing the unthinkable, the stomach churning, the death defying, all just to entertain an audience. In Toronto, Canada, ringmaster Scott McClelland takes the stage. For Scott, whose stage name is Nikolai Diablo, shocking a willing audience is a full-time profession. While others might spend their time toiling in offices, Scott eats razor blades drinks boiling water, and hammers nails up his nose. We brought to the public something that was sorely needed in our plastic, humdrum, yuppieized world. Sideshows are selling thrills, from new acts to age-old stunts like sword swallowing. In Carnival Diablo, Vanessa Neal keeps alive a long and perilous tradition. So many people before me have died on stage sword swallowing. And that's what the audience is buying. The very real danger that these performers will seriously injure themselves or even die right before their very eyes. There's a morbid sense of curiosity that draws the audiences in constantly because we are taking our life into our own hands. When they're there in the audience, they are hoping that maybe tonight might be the night where the big accident takes place. And I think that's one of the reasons people come, because if they can't take the risk themselves, at least they can witness it. Carnival Diablo has gained a loyal audience because it taps into a very basic human urge. Sideshows and freak shows are ways of showing us what it would be like to live out our fantasies. Carolyn Marvin is a professor of anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Of course, human beings have violent fantasies. One way to keep them under control is to have them be organized for us. For a moment, we can focus on them, we can imagine them, and then we can leave them behind. For years, the best place to do that was under the tent of the traveling circus, a place Scott has known since childhood. Well, my grandfather owned the largest traveling circus sideshow in Canada from 1920 through 1968. I was aware at a very young age that my grandmother could swallow seven swords. Also, that my grandfather was known as a human pincushion. What could be more inspiring to an impressionable boy? Scott knew he wanted to follow in his grandfather's footsteps. But by the 1960s, sideshows had lost their appeal. Freak shows came to be seen as exploitive. Sideshow acts dismissed as crude and old hat. But then came the 1990s. 
a new generation rediscovered the body's potential as art, and the sideshow was reborn. You're seeing more and more people walking around with piercings and tattoos. They almost seem to be attracted to it because it's becoming familiar. They feel an affinity to what's going on on stage. Tapping into this craze, Scott launched Carnival Diablo in 1992. His biggest challenge? Keeping several steps ahead of the latest extreme. Tonight, Scott holds a rehearsal at his house. It's actually good to run. He's ready to show off a new routine. And this is position one. A handmade variation of Russian roulette. Last year, I was playing a game of Russian roulette with a uh, buck knife, and I put the knife right through my hand. And you can see the scar there. I lost the game miserably. Now, I am willing tomorrow night to do something that's equally as stupid by playing a game of Russian roulette with a nine inch long galvanized construction spike. I am going to have to crush three bags and leave one standing. This is going to be I'm very trepidatious about doing it, but it's time to get back on the horse. Sideshows must do one of two things, shock or disgust. Vanessa is a master at the disgusting part. Once a week, she buys props for what many call Carnival Diablo's most revolting act. Probably about eight years ago, we were doing our first rehearsal, and I popped it right in my mouth, crunch, crunch, ah, swallow. No problem. Oh, nice. I'm going to eat the worms. Mm -hmm. They're my favorite. They're so much fun. <laughs> Coming up, meet a performer at the extreme edge of Sideshow. And later, step into the secret world of the Japanese geisha. It's showtime at Carnival Diablo. Backstage, a striking transformation is underway. Before they face the knives, nails, and swords, the performers must alter themselves, mentally and physically, for the dangers ahead. When I started with Carnival Diablo, there was such a challenge to really face your fears, you know, do something that you just never, ever expected yourself to be able to do. Like maybe eat live insects. Vanessa warms up the audience with a light snack. A handful of crawling crickets. Followed by a mouthful of wriggling earthworms. It's an act guaranteed to incite the crowd. You know, when people are disgusted, uh, they have two kinds of reactions. One is a sort of a disgust face and but the other one is laughter. Paul Rosen is a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And that laughter is sort of a nervous kind of laughter. All of these sensitivities are very much tuned by culture. There are many cultures that eat insects. Shall we begin? Yeah! Few acts inspire as much audience anxiety as playing with sharp objects. Place your bets! It's time to play! Carney Roulette! It's the moment Scott's been dreading, but he's ready to risk impaling his hand on a nine-inch spike. Intuitively, he knows how to keep the audience on the edge of their seats. When we watch people do extreme things, one of the things we're seeing is our own imagination at work. We're watching people survive ordeals that we actually wouldn't attempt ourselves. And so it's all right in the end because the person who is performing the extreme act goes away whole, apparently. So we don't have to suffer the consequences of this kind of behavior, and yet, 
we get to imaginatively participate in it and see what it would be like. And that's why you're paying to see us, because the fact that we're transcending so many ideas of what you can't do in life these days. Everybody has rules, and we're constantly trying to break them. And those who can't break the rules themselves will happily pay to see others do it for them. It's entertainment. It's funny when someone else gets hurt. <laughs> I just think it's absolutely interesting. I think it's great that people do all kinds of weird stuff like that. I think the motivator is, is just be, to do something different. I mean, everyone just does the standard things. Go to a movie, go to dinner, eat some fire. That's different. <laughs> It is the same type of fascination, I think, that you get uh, with people uh, rubbernecking at a car wreck. Gerald Urchak is a professor of anthropology at Skidmore College. Perhaps the car isn't even in the road. It's off to the side, but traffic slows down and is backed up for 18 miles because everybody wants to see. In the world of extreme acts, Few can rival Tim Cridlin. His stage name is Zamora, the Torture King. His game, self-mutilation. Skewers going through the arms, exit wounds, entrance. His cheeks are permanently scarred from shoving hundreds of skewers through them. Anywhere else? I do that every night. And, I and bruises mark the spots where sewing needles have been woven into his skin. Unlike Scott, Tim is not an offspring of circus performers. His fascination with pushing his body to the limit began at age 10 with a book about strange performers through history. The fact is, I'm just kind of emulating in the past. In fact, that's pretty much what I, what I specialize in, uh, kind of replicating these things that are um, completely lost in a way. I swallow this light bulb. One of Tim's most popular acts is eating a light bulb. I want to see if it melts a little more than I can chew. And I got a hammer over here. I guess there's no turning back. The highlight of Tim's act is when he slides a razor-sharp skewer all the way through his arm. Some people find this fascinating, disgusting, but fascinating. Other people can't watch it. But Tim claims he never feels a thing. I've kind of linked up my mind and body in a way that if I, I choose not to feel pain, I can, I can overcome that. The fascination is to safely watch other people performing these taboo acts. And for most of us, not only are they taboo, if we tried them ourselves, we would really be hurt. Obviously, this is something no one should attempt at home. But Tim, has ways of protecting his body. I actually lower my blood pressure, so that's one of the reasons it doesn't bleed as much as you think it would. It's a trick he learned from some Eastern cultures, where worshipers torture themselves as part of age-old rituals. From Thailand to Bali to Nepal, it's a way of getting in touch with the gods. These types of activities are associated with people who have deep, deep faith in their belief system and in what they're doing. These are not, you know, Sunday service people. If they believe that spirits enter their body or that they can summon a spirit to make them strong, uh, they really believe it. And uh, that probably makes it easier for them to do it, though. In the West, sideshow performers like Tim use the same techniques but to entertain a 